Kat, would you, um, when I start to talk about bios, would you drop them in the chat for me, please? Definitely. Yep. Okay. Thank I'm going to go ahead and hit start the webinar. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll get started in just a minute or two while we let uh, folks join. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Still um, waiting for a few more folks to join us. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. <clears throat> My name is Amika Riali. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the membership director at Law for Black Lives. I am a black woman um, with light brown skin and hair pulled into a bun. I'm wearing a green shirt and I'm sitting in an office chair in front of a white wall or background. Um, we are super, super excited to have this conversation. We're excited to be in conversation with our panelists. Um, the Our panelists are dope. We think it's going to be a dope conversation and a great way to uh, close out Black History Month. Before we get started, um, I just want to let you know that you can ask questions that will be answered at the end of this um, webinar. 
So you can pose them in the chat and we'll collect them or you can wait until the end. You can also feel free to interact with panelists in the chat. You can express agreement or, or anything that resonates with you, pluses, whatever you want to put there. You can feel free to put that there. Um, our panelists will do a bit of introducing themselves also, um, but we will put their longer full length bios in the chat so that you um, can take a look at those and get some more um, information about them. So we'll start with short introductions, then we'll have a grounding and then we'll go right into the Q&A. So um, I'll start by kicking it to Judith to start off. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Judith Brown Dianis. She, her, hers. I am the executive director of the National Office of Advancement Projects, which is a national racial justice organization steeped in movement lawyering. Uh, I am sitting here with my Police Free Schools organizer t-shirt on um, and in my home with my painting from the off the streets of Havana, Cuba. Um, and so that's who I am living in Maryland. Our office is in DC, not that we go there anymore. So I will kick it to uh, Jeribu, who also <laughs> shares a birthday with me, April 6th. Indeed, and I heard that when you said not that we go there anymore. So I'm Jeribu Hill, she, her pronouns, and um, I am with currently with the organization I founded, the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. Although I must say I was for two decades or more before becoming a lawyer, I was an organizer on the streets of New York and in the Southern region. So lawyering is like my fifth career. I am donning my beautiful black and white t-shirt that was gifted to me by uh, by Marbury when I saw it I saw her in the t-shirt at a conference I said where's mine she pulled it out of her tote bag and gave it to me and I went to the bathroom and changed so I'm in my black radical lawyer t-shirt uh, behind me is the great Fannie Lou Hamer my guiding force who I channel in all my work where she says I am sick and tired of being sick and tired, which is the only part of that quote that people usually quote, but she also says we must we must stand up for our freedom. So that's that's who I am. I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation with comrades and sisters that I've known for many years. Akichi, you want to go next? Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so very much for inviting me. I'm Nikichi Taifa. I am the president and CEO of the Taifa Group LLC. And I am the convener of the Justice Roundtable, which is a coalition of over 100 organizations working in Washington on federal criminal justice policy issues. I am a longstanding member of the National Conference of Black Lawyers. I am a founding member of INCOBA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And I am an inaugural commissioner on NARC, the National African American Reparations uh, Commission. Uh, again, I've been in the movement forever and ever <laughs> since really a teenage, I was a teenager. I am a deeply melanated uh, elder woman. <laughs> uh, I have locks in my hair. I've always worn my hair in some type of natural um, uh, uh, state. I am wearing uh, African hair wrap, which was actually my signature style almost every single day. Um, up until when I joined the establishment as a lawyer, and then I still wear it all the time. Um, I have a, a Africa red, black, and green pendant, and I'm standing behind. I'm sitting behind uh, my bookcase, which is one of quite a number of bookcases around uh, my home. And again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Ava Tara. You want to go next? Hi, um, my name is Ava Tara Smith Carrington. I use they, them pronouns. I am currently the Tyrone Garner Memorial Law Fellow with Lambda Legal. Um, Lambda Legal is the nation's oldest, <laughs> largest uh, civil rights organization um, dedicated to achieving 
um, our recognition of civil rights for LGBTQ people and everyone living with HIV. Um, I am wearing a denim shirt uh, and a green beanie, although you might not be able to tell. Uh, and there's a print of Basquiat in the background and like the dope black, green and red flag as well. Um, oh, and I'm based right now in Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Christian. Thanks, Amika. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Christian Snow. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I am an associate attorney at the People's Law Office, um, and I'm also a part of an organization in Chicago called Asada's Daughters. Um, I am a brown-skinned Black woman um, with a blonde, brown, and Black afro that looks short right now, but I swear five hours ago it was pretty big. Uh, <laughs> I have on <laughs> a pendant um, that is a Mexican fire opal uh, that is red and pink, um, surrounded by gold and silver, and I'm wearing all Black in front of a white background. Beautiful. Hello, everybody. My name is Ma Bray. I use she and her pronouns. I'm the director of Law for Black Lives and just super humbled and excited to be on this panel and grateful for Amika and folks for bringing us all together. Um, I am wearing a linen, which is out of season because <laughs> it's cold, um, green uh, top. And I am light skinned brown black woman with uh, curly hair and a ponytail and big earrings. And I'm sitting in a room with a teal walls and um, a bookcase behind me, as well as portraits um, done by an amazing black artist out of England of Toni Morrison, James Baldwin and Nina Simone. Um, and I'm sitting next to a book by Alfred Nikitsha, which just got published a while ago and is amazing. So shout out to this book, which I will put the title um, in the chat. Thank you so much for those um, lovely introductions. And um, the way this will go for the rest of the evening, for the rest of the webinar, is that we'll have a grounding um, done by Marbury, and then we'll just start having some questions. So each of the panelists will answer a few questions, and then we'll um, take some questions from the audience, and then we'll close out. So Marbury, take us away. Oh, thank you. So we just wanted to, I think, start off the conversation with a grounding in what we mean by movement lawyering. And I think this is necessary in part um, because in Celebration of Black History Month, we have brought together and gathered um, incredible Black lawyers um, who have practiced in ways that have been so akin to an embodiment of movement lawyering. But the reality is that for many Black lawyers, the term movement lawyer doesn't feel applicable to them. And I think we want to just kind of ground in what this term means to us and why law for Black lives is so concerned with bringing it to our people um, and figuring out how do we kind of um, approach it and manifest it in ways that make sense to us. So I want to start by saying that traditionally the term movement lawyering has been philosophized and kind of scholarized, those are words I just made up, um, by mostly white men, honestly. And so they've talked about what it means to support, to build, to strengthen movement from, I think, the perspective often of outsiders um, because of where they are from, because of their class, their race, and their ethnic um, and their gender background. And I think what's unique about this panel and this moment and our organization is really centering the practices of movement lawyering inside of the communities that we come from and saying and naming that we are using strategies, philosophies, and ideas that really um, are based and come from where we come from. And so we're not outsiders stepping in. We're not kind of, um, we're not, you know, folks who are approaching this through our own lenses of privilege, but instead we're actually from these places and trying to make a difference. And so I want to ground us in this reality that although it is often white men who theorize about movement lawyering, it has historically been Black folks, especially Black femmes, GNC, and Black women who have done movement lawyering. And in many ways, the work we do embodies the very principles of movement lawyering. So I want to start by kind of naming what we at Law for Black Lives think those are. Um, and then I'm super excited to have this panel talk about the ways that those have manifested in, in folks' work. Um, so I think, first of all, you know, movement lawyering is, is about the why. Um, the with who and the how you loyal. 
And in many ways, the why I think is the most important. And so when we talk about movement learning, what we're talking about is using our legal skills, our legal positions and our privileges um, as a way of building the power of movements. And the reason why is because we believe the way that change happens is not inside of courtrooms. It's not because you change a law. It's not because you get a policy victory. It's because the power of people, of movements, that when folks who are most impacted have the chance to lead, have the chance to pose both the solutions and the diagnosis of the problems that we can actually see long-term sustainable change. And this differs from an idea that in fact, if you win a single court case or pass a single law, that that's the way to victory. And I think that we as black folks have always known that every time we've made progress for our people, it's been a combination of factors and the law and courtrooms might be one of those factors, but really the power of the people of organized demands of folks who are most impacted has been the front line of innovation and change. And so movement learning accepts as kind of a given that change happens not through legal ways, that we shouldn't center legal strategies, but that change all actually happens when people are empowered to make the change. And so we understand law as one tool in our toolbox, but not the central one. And I think one thing that's happened a lot in the history of lawyering is that lawsuits, litigation, or policy gets centered as the only way to make change. And that actually shuts down space, creativity, and power for communities who have to live through that change. And so movement lawyers believe, um, both because we've studied history and because we know um, our own experiences, that the way that change happens is when lawyers throw down to support movement. Um, and that when we decenter legal strategies, and we say that this is one tool in many, but it's not the most effective and it's not the only one. Um, movement lawyering is also different in the kind of with who. And so traditionally lawyers have kind of been in relationship with a single client or a single space um, and had very kind of strict ideas on what a client lawyer relationship looks like. It's very hierarchical. There are power dynamics and all of that. Movement lawyering really embraces an idea that we lawyer with and for movement. That it's about how do we help to build power and shift power away from lawyers and legal center processes into community organizations and base building organizations. And so the with who is different in movement learning. It's not just you and your client. It's you and the organizations that you are part of, that you are aligned with, you are accountable to and committed to. Um, movement learning is also different because of the how. And so very often, I think a lot of legal processes we engage in tend to re-legitimize the law as the most useful tool, tend to give more power to the same system actors. And so we think about reforms that add more power to judges or or PDs or DAs, um, movement lawyers actually want to shift power away from lawyers into communities. And so it's about how do we create democratic processes throughout all of our work, whether it's policy work or litigation work or class action work that actually is decentering the court as the kind of the theater or the center of action and moving it to community meetings and hearings and media um, and political education opportunities, right? And so it's really about how do we shift power and focus away from lawyers and legal processes into communities the most kind of need and dissolve and are fighting for them. Um, I think it's important to name this because often the what of movement lawyering looks the same. We use litigation, we use policy, we use the same tools that many lawyers use, but we use them towards different ends with different people and with different aims in mind. And I think this idea of really shifting power um, is a really important one. And as black folks, I think we've always understood the importance of relationships, that so much of the work that we do is about how do we be a non-transactional relationships with the movements we're supporting. And I think the other difference between often kind of white the theorizing and movement learning and black practicing is the like, how come, right? And so a lot of us are loyal to get free. That we're lawyering because we want to and we believe in the liberation of our people. And so our politics, our work is moving in that direction. And so we are overtly political and unapologetically so. Um, and so I think it's important to, to understand that, that although I think um, a lot of the ways we've talked about movement lawyering feels as if kind of outsiders coming in, that the practice of lawyering from Polly Moy to duty to Judy and the work that she's doing, um, to Law of Black Lives, to Christian, the folks on this panel, really is concerned about how are we kind of digging in where we are and where we come from. Um, and that I think is a different kind of quality than traditional movement lawyering. And so just wanna kind of put that as the, the kind of the grounding. I think very often, as I said, um, we meet dope movement lawyers who are like, I'm not a movement lawyer. That's not really like a, like a black thing. And it's like, no, it is. Like, this is the things that we're doing. And so wanna really introduce and reclaim and reown um, the title of movement lawyering and the work that we're doing is really embodying it. 
Thank you. Thank you for that, Marbury. That was a solid, a solid grounding. Look, um, panel over. No. <laughs> Um, so I want to shift us into what are more like longer introductions, especially because I think, as you said, Marbray, when we think about when lots of folks think so, think about movement lawyering or community lawyering or being a radical lawyer, there's a lot of conversation about the contributions that white folks have made, particularly white men. And so I'd love to hear from each of our panelists. Um, just about your journey to where you are in your move in movement lawyering. If you consider yourself like I am a movement lawyer or you're sort of getting there or you're a radical lawyer, like how did you tell us about that journey um, and tell us about a moment or a series of moments where you were radicalized and like directed towards this work and how do, how do you prepare yourself for this work? And that I know for some of us is a longer story, but that's what we're here for. <laughs> we wanna hear that. Um, who would like to kick us off? I can kick it. <laughs> um, Marbury, that was beautiful. Uh, I, I feel like I'm one of those people, um, and maybe it's because I'm new, but I'm still trying to consider myself a lawyer in the first place, like whether or not that that is true for me. I mean, some of y'all who know me know I say it all the time. I'm like, I that is not a title I have absorbed yet. And in part of that, part of the like non-absorption of the title of lawyer um, comes from um, some experiences I've had in organizing where uh, lawyers would want to show up when there is a need for a lawyer and not be present when there isn't one. Um, and for me, uh, the multitude of ways that rubs me the wrong way um, and the multitude of ways that wasn't who I wanted um, to be um, has led me to disclaim that title um, because I never want to get so rooted in that title that I forget that I'm supposed to be a person who shows up for the movement and uses whatever tools that I have available to myself. And so if I'm showing up to a protest and what they need is for me to pass out flyers or hold the line, that's what I'm gonna do. If I am showing up in a community event and what they need is for me to make room for some of the elders to be able to get to the mic, that is what I'm gonna do. If I'm showing up um, at an organizing event and what they need for me to do is pass out supplies, that's what I'm going to do. And if folks get locked up while we're doing that work and they need someone to go advocate for folks in the jail, that's what I'm going to do um, because I now have that set of tools. And so for me, um, I'm still, again, still working on what it, what it means to, to have the legal tool set at my um, disposal now. Um, but I always want to remember that the reason that I went and got this tool set in the first place is because I want it to be of assistance to my folks who I'm regularly fighting alongside of. Um, and I want to be able to um, do it in a way um, that makes sense for the strategy that we're uh, enacting. Um, I don't think that was the question that you asked Amika. It was more about like what <laughs> radicalized us, but I don't have an answer for that for that one either. I mean, um, part of that is for me has been just life. Um, growing up in Chicago um, and my whole family being from Chicago and um, organizing with folks block by block on the ground, first through religious organizing and then extending that. Um, but coming from a Black Baptist background, our religious organizing looked real social politic e, <laughs> And uh, I've left the religious part and kept the social politic part. Um, and for me, um, becoming a lawyer was about being really frustrated that I was being kept out of rooms because I didn't have a certain toolkit, a certain um, amount of credentials, certain letters behind my name. I couldn't walk in rooms and, and help my folks um, or walk alongside them. Um, and so it was important for me to go to law school, but when I, went to law school, the first thing I said was, I'm not here to become a lawyer. And my law school seemed to like that for some reason, I don't know. 
<laughs> but I said, I'm here to get an understanding of how y'all built this. How did you build this? How can I tear it down? Uh, where are the, you know, um, pieces? Where are the um, fault lines? Where are the things that I can um, get into and tear apart? Uh, because what y'all have built is incredibly evil, harming all my folks. Um, and I, I want to be able to remove it. And the first thing that needs to topple is this understanding that law is God in this country. Um, and so that's why I went to law school. Then I got to law school and I said, oh, wait, all of y'all are going to be lawyers for Black people? <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> you all are terrible. How do I stop this from happening? Or how do I interrupt it? Um, and so I became a litigator. Um, and for the most part, the radical piece I have down, pulling up from the roots, tearing things down, rebuilding, um, focus, a focus on community, a focus on folks, all of that I have down. The lawyering piece is the one um, that I'm still working on, how we utilize this, um, not just in defense, but in offense. How do we utilize this in a way that doesn't alienate our folks? How do we utilize this in a, a way that doesn't um, just seek to stroke our own egos, but seeks to get things done? And the thing that we want done is liberation. Um, so that's been my path and kind of where I'm at. Um, and I'm glad I went first so you can let all these other beautiful, wonderful <laughs> stories <laughs> take us and inspire us um, and inspire me um, in ways that I, I just know are coming. So I think I will go on and follow Christian if that's okay. Um, so I know the moment when I decided I want to be a, a lawyer, but even before that, growing up, I always was a, 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 an inquisitive child, I guess you could say. My parents were educators, and I remember sitting in the den of my parents' um, home. We had bookshelves and all like that, and flipping through this book that was called A Pictorial History of the Negro in America. We're talking about, you know, like... Um, now mid 60s I'm doing this and I'm coming across this um the story of Emmett Till basically of which I had never heard of before and I'm absolutely and completely shocked because Emmett Till was murdered when I was about five months old and I'm thinking all of this happened way back in what I considered slavery times which was millions of years ago I had no conception of of time and it just really left an imprint upon me. And then finding out that Fannie Lou Hamer was arrested just for trying to register to vote when I'm in first and second grade. And you know, all of these things left an imprint. So when I get to junior high school, and this was during the time when black studies was coming into the schools, uh, we're talking about the late sixties. And um, there was a course called black studies or whatever it was. And I knew I wanted to take it. I already knew there was something about blackness that I wanted to be about and I wanted to take this course. And on the bulletin board of my eighth grade black studies class was this poster of a black man with a black beret on his head with a spear in one hand and a rifle in another hand sitting in a grand slam wicker chair. And all my girlfriends in eighth grade were talking about how fine this brother was. But I kept asking the teacher, well, why is he in prison? And I'm asking, why is the head of the Black Panther Party being represented by white lawyers? I'm wondering where are the Black lawyers to represent Black people? And from that moment, I knew that there was some kind, those white lawyers, they were radical lawyers, they were progressive lawyers, but they weren't Black. And I just could not understand where were the Black lawyers representing um, Black people. So I knew I wanted that to be uh, my path. But I didn't go to the path of the lawyer. I became part of the movement. I'm selling Black Panther Party papers on the streets of Washington, DC. Never was a member of the Black Panther Party. I would never own that. But I used to go to their PE uh, classes. And um, the most I would really do is sit on the lap of that fine brother who was pulling security in the front office of the Black Panther uh, Party. But I'm sitting down and um, uh, um, you know, listening to everything that they're saying and doing. They had this little red book, Chairman Mao's, um, um, uh, you know, little red book. And in their Black Panther paper, point number three was talking about payback for slavery. And that really had an impact on me. I'm in high school. 
And I'm talking about reparations anywhere and everywhere I could go. Most folk, you know, um, laughed at me. You know, you're not serious. This will never happen. And it just dawned on me, maybe people would take things I'm saying a little bit more seriously if I did get, as Christian uh, said, those letters behind uh, my name. But I was well into being part of the movement, the anti-apartheid movement, the new African independence movement, the black liberation struggle before I even went to law school. So when I ended up going to law school in 1980, which was several years after graduating from undergrad, I already went there knowing about civil procedure, knowing about criminal law, knowing about international law, knowing that I wanted to use the law creatively to find innovative ways in which we could use the law to deal with our, uh, our, our situation and, and our uh, you know, oppression. So I went there already with a consciousness. The legal cases that I was involved with, I was not someone from outside. I was part of the movement as a movement lawyer, we didn't call it movement lawyer back then, y'all. We call it like people's lawyer, you know, all like that. But it's all good. So I'm going to just stop there and just say that I'm just grateful that this new generation, you all, I mean, you all are part of new generation. Some of us are still part of the older generation, have really grabbed the bull by the horns and really taken this on. So I'll go. Um, so. I, you know, so I appreciate that, Nikichi, that, that story. Um, you know, so for me, I, I want to come back to what Mar said about power, right? And power being central to what we do as movement lawyers, because for me, it was that I saw at a young age in a household with a mother who was an organizer, activist, educator, that when she took me to my first protest that I remember at the age of three, that we were able to get change in the government, right? And so, and then in college and in law school, seeing like how organizing could actually change things, right? And so when I come out of law school, and I went to law school because I actually was a victim of job discrimination, I was like, I'm going to white people ain't doing this to nobody else. I'm a super bunch of folks. And so, but I came out and wanted to practice civil rights law. And what I found was that I was losing a lot of cases because the law didn't want us to be free, right? The courts didn't want us to be free. And that I was filing a lot of cases that nobody cared about, the community didn't care about. I'm going into communities trying to find plaintiffs. Oh yeah, let it go. Like y'all, yeah, I want to find because it's an important issue. But the community was like, I remember one of my first cases. It was, it was an education case, and I went to Alabama and I was like talking to people. I had to find some plaintiffs and all that, and I telling them about this case we're gonna file, and they said to me, "Well, actually, you know what we'd like? We'd like." running water. And I was like, oh, sorry, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to bring this education case. And so years later, like being doing that work for a while and also seeing that what I was doing was that I could win something or settle something, but that I'm the one who's following up on the consent decree or the settlement, because again, the community didn't care about what I was doing. And so left that job to start this new thing and learned how to be a movement lawyer in Mississippi. Um, learned from being at the table with organizers about the role of the lawyer being back up to the movement. Um, that the law, which I already knew, um, was restrictive and that when we went into court, we were potentially giving up power to a white man in a black robe who would make a decision about what the community needed. And so started to learn that there were actually other ways that we could get the change that community wanted that didn't have to be in the courtroom and that the courtroom could be a tool but we would use it strategically. And that the other pieces that we wanted to bring to it at Advancement Project was communications, because we knew 
that we had to move the narrative on some of these issues that we wanted to we wanted to win. And so for me, this power piece is incredibly important um, and accountability because I'm at a national organization. So I'm not sitting in Mississippi like Jeribu is. And I remember when we first started Mask Project, Jeribu was like, how y'all gonna be a national organization coming up in Mississippi? But the thing is that what we wanted to do was to work with grassroots organizations and be accountable to that community. And actually in some ways, I, you know, even though I am getting on a plane and dropping in, the partnership and the relationship that we build and the ability to understand the genius of ordinary people, as Ella Baker would say, right? Like I consider myself an Ella Baker lawyer, right? Is important to what we do. And that sometimes even when we're in community as lawyers, we start to think we know what the community wants and needs because we're the lawyer and we live there. And so we should do things. So there's another perch that I get from being able to say, I'm not there. Who am I accountable to? Who asked me to file that lawsuit? They didn't ask you to do that. You're doing something to them instead of for them. And so I think that that's the work that we have to do. And it's also for us about freedom. And so we have to understand that the law is not the thing that's gonna get us free. And the law right now is wrong. So when you come to advance a project, I tell lawyers, the, the law is wrong. Y'all, y'all, you going into court, you better rewrite the law when you go into court because it's not gonna get my people free. So I'll stop there. I could go next and, and put the disclaimer of what Judith said. I have never used anybody's help if they come right. Uh, we are, you know, and Judith has come right. She was not in type lawyer. And so, you know, even before her advancement project, I think we first met when you were at LBF and uh, the experience was positive always. And whenever anyone comes into the state of Mississippi, it is an experience, it's a baptism, it's a way of saying, hey, if I come to Mississippi and do some work, I know I'm bad, I'm bad to the bone because I stuck it out, I stayed, I did it. But actually, I have roots, I have family roots. My dad is from Deason, Mississippi, which is just up the road, 70 miles away from where I live in Mississippi and Greenville. My mom's people are from Shaw, Mississippi, which is in Bolivar County. And you might only know about uh, state, uh, what, um, Delta State University. Well, also in that same county is my mom's hometown. My mom and her brothers were born in Memphis, but they were raised by Mississippi Delta parents. I start with uh, the phase of my life when I was on the historically black college campus of Central State University, one of two colleges in Ohio, one of two historically black colleges in Ohio. And there I met a guy and I was mesmerized by him. He was a member of the US and I lost my mind. I literally lost my mind and also my virginity. And that drove me crazy because I felt like, wow, I gotta be this, I gotta be all this, I gotta be a revolutionary so this man will stay, so I can hold on to this man. I can't be the knucklehead drinking Ripple on the Friday nights and you know testing out marijuana. I gotta be right. I gotta wear African clothes, I gotta speak Swahili. I can't be the fool that I was when I showed up as a preacher's daughter who couldn't watch bandstand, who couldn't play cards, couldn't do anything because my dad was literally a tyrant and my mother was obedient to him, even though she was an aggressive woman. And you know, fit that into two bodies. So I literally left college in my third and a half year to join the movement following after this man who turned out to be no good. When I get to the Committee for Unified Newark and I meet Amidi Baraka and Amina Baraka, and I knew they knew that I was a knucklehead. I knew they knew that I was like this petty bourgeois Negro from college and she's gonna come up in here and what, you know, she's got this fancy way of talking. What is her deal? So I knew people were sort of suspicious of me because I wasn't right. I came for the wrong reasons. But I tell you, when I realized my calling, 
not as a lawyer, but as an organizer, as an activist was when I was shut down completely. Nikichi, I know you know this kind of stuff. I walk into a room. I'm there representing the Committee of Unified Newark. I've got on African garb head to toe while sisters are dressed in house dresses. So right away, I look like a fool. I look ridiculous. I look like I'm in ceremonial garb where people could barely find water to drink and food to eat. So to make a long story short, I sit down. I, I don't even sit down with them because they're sitting on the floor because there are no seats. They're squatting at Scudder Homes in Newark, New Jersey. I stand sort of in the corner lurking in my way of, you know, I'm gonna teach these people something, I'm gonna show them something. And at some point I did open my mouth and I said, well, you know, I think that the best thing for us to do and the sister who I still remember to this day, I can't remember her, I can't remember her name, but I remember her face. And she was a keynote speaker at the Women's March in DC. She said to me, who the fuck are you and if you sit down in that corner somewhere, we'll let you stay. So now the ego was talking, you know, because I'm an Aries, I don't like to be wrong, I don't want nobody challenging me, I, and I damn sure don't like to be embarrassed. So I thought to myself, well, now I could leave. I could run for the hills, go to that door and get the hell out, right? Or I could stay. Well, staying is what you see. I stayed. I got married up with the sufferers in a way that I should have known anyway because of my family roots, but I'd lost it. And that experience at the Committee of Unified Newark grounded me in a way that I've never been grounded before that and since. The Black Power Movement, being a part of organizations like the National Conference of Black Lawyers, I was a NCBL member when I was a cultural artist before I went to law school. So I decided to go to law school on a dare. I heard that this really mediocre girl who was an operator on my campus was not only a lawyer, but now the, a judge. And at one point she was the head of the black, judge, black women judges. I said, oh hell, if she can go to law school, I can go to law school. So I went to law school on a dare, right? Knowing I wasn't good at standardized tests, knowing all of that, I still said, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna take a chance. So I went to law school, then I applied for a Scadden Fellowship, didn't think I was gonna get it because I wasn't going to an Ivy League school. And you know, I just had the obstacles in the way, along the way, and lo and behold, I got the fellowship. I said, oh shit, I said I was going to Mississippi. Wow, if I'd known that I was actually gonna get it, maybe I wouldn't have said that, but it's too late. It's out there in the wind. Everyone knows Jeribu is going to Mississippi to be a lawyer. What was I thinking when I arrived in Mississippi, Judith? I saw two things in Oxford, Mississippi, when I arrived to do my scadding with legal services. I saw a banner that said, heritage, not hate, save our flag and welcome Elvis scholars. And I said, what the hell did you do? You in a place where the song thief has scholarship behind his name and they talk about draping your ass in a Confederate flag. What are you doing? So I, I just, I, I hunkered down. I, I, I got baptized in it. I, I couldn't say no to anything at first. And that was what I had to learn. You had to focus and you had to figure out what your, what your track was going to be. I found myself in two areas, hate violence in the workplace where nooses were being made, where Klan recruitment was going on. And we did a big case against the largest employer in the state. Of course, we couldn't get class certification because uh, that was not available to us, okay? No matter how much our people suffered. But we did the cases in clusters. We were able to get relief, but more importantly, we were able to get zero tolerance for hate violence at North of Grumman ship systems. I, I moved then to other areas of workers' rights work, dealing with sexual harassment, dealing with the fact that Black women, Black women always got somebody's hands on them against their will. I represented people who, in fact, had been touched and harmed and experienced erections in their faces while they were working. These were the kinds of cases that I cut my teeth on, standing beside some of the most brilliant lawyers who were also activists, because that's the thing. Activism and lawyering, that's, that's an important combination. And I think because I wasn't a lawyer first, because I didn't go to law school right out of college, that it helped me to understand that you could play a role if you commit class suicide, as Cabral says, 
if you shed your privilege and shrink yourself, you can blow up your people, so to speak. You can make them larger than life and force people to see them. So that's the work. That's the work I've been doing. I, I feel like we are in Dred Scott courts. I feel like we still are standing at a well where people don't see us as human, but our job, our job is to stand there and make sure that our people are not in abstention, but make sure our people are completely and totally present. We don't see ourselves as local. Yes, we are statewide, but we also are the anchor organization of the Southern Human Rights Organizers Conference. And we convene every other year, Southern human rights defenders who come and grapple with these issues. So we see ourselves as internationalists. We see our organization as a human rights organization and we are black led and we don't apologize for the fact that we, be, we believe that black sufferers deserve black leadership and they damn sure deserve black lawyers who are uncompromising. We're not gonna sell them out, sell them something because it's easy. And that's the challenge always for us. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad I told you that little snippet about what I lost and I found myself after I got rid of him he, he did me in and another woman, not just me, he tried to be a little polygamist as he claimed he was a Muslim, but he was a fake ass Muslim. And he, he basically, he did me in and then he went on a trip to Newark to help get the first black mayor elected. And while there, he hooked up with another sister. And so it just, I mean, it shows you what you got. You got to push it, you got to push it to the side and realized that there was something. And I, this brother, I'll never forget it. You know him in Kichi, Tyreef Warren. He looked at me, he was on that campus. He was a senior at Central State when I was a freshman. He said to me, he said, you know, sister, there's potential there. I said, what are you talking about? And what is that black band around your arm? What is all that about? Oh, sister, that's El Haj Malik. I was such an idiot. I said, what, who, who is that, who? I mean, I was a dumb ass teenager on campus who had never heard of Malcolm. So, but he was patient with me and he didn't throw me aside. He saw some potential in me. So that's what I can say is that that's what I try to do in return. I try to see where we can pull from people if they come. I feel like if you come in this way, you're coming for a reason. And I just welcome folks coming to our region coming to the state. I know that Judith in her national work, they've crisscrossed across many Southern states, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina. I encourage people to do some of your grounding work in the deep South. You will know when you are there, you will know how much you're needed, but also it will give you a particular purpose and a sense of grace that you might not have had before. So I, I recruit, I actively recruit people to come to Mississippi Goddamn, as Nina called it, and do this work and learn more about Emmett Till. We still don't have justice for him. I was just on a call today about the betrayal and about this Negro district attorney who has no spine, needs a surgery to get a spine because he's just so backless. But with that said, we don't let it stop us, we just keep coming. And this is, this is remarkable to have all these scary black women on, on one screen. This is too dangerous. They might shut this down before we finish. Jeribu, thank you so much for that. I see you naming names, just <laughs> bringing it all out, bringing it all out. Um, uh, Avatar, would you mind uh, going next for us? Yeah, sure. I know it's a hard, it's a tough act to follow. I really don't know how you follow that up at all. Um, <laughs> Avatar, they, them pronouns again. Um, I'll make this really short. Um, so I grew up in New Jersey. So you're talking about Newark and my grandmother lives literally on the border of Newark and Hillside. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I, I grew up in Jersey City. And what I'll say is that I actually fell into the law. Like I tell people that honestly, I didn't expect to ever do this. Um, I literally told my parents, I was like, maybe I'll do this thing. And they took me very seriously. Um, my dad is an immigrant from the West Indies. My mom is an amazing, beautiful educator in New Jersey. Um, and you know, my, my grandmother, uh, she'll tell you stories of being on the Chitlin circuit and like segregation. And my other grandma will tell you stories of her being a domestic worker in New York and figuring out how to make ends meet in order to bring her children to the US. Um, and so when I was thinking about like what I wanted to do in terms of like, what does it look like to, to build with community? I thought of it as the possibility of going to law school, not because I thought that the law was gonna get us any freer, but I was just like to like, what I'm hearing from other folks is just like, all right, what does this thing do? Because what I know for a fact is that it um, tends to bind people up who look like me 
and then living at the intersection of a couple of different identities, being black, being queer, being um, trans in terms of like, you know, all that good stuff. I was just like, all right, I really, really want to know what the law does and what there is to offer, um, especially because I know that there's a lot happening in this world um, that cuts in terms of like everything that was hitting hard in terms of police violence, in terms of thinking about um, the climate and like all these different things. So I really was like, all right, let's see what the law has to offer. Um, and so, so actually I wasn't going to stay in law school because I saw what it had to offer. And I was like, oh no, this is not for me. I'm not about this life. Um, mostly because I looked around at my peers and they were all white and they were going into this field. And I'm like, this, this specific area is already violent because of whiteness. Um, and I'm seeing other students kind of getting indoctrinated into this. And it scared me to be honest, because I was just like, I just don't see what it looks like on the other side. And thankfully I had amazing, amazing professors, specifically um, Professor um, Tanya Banks, who like I became her research assistant. And I was just like, you're brilliant. I love the way that you talk about black women in the law. I was like, I see your path forward. Um, and since then I've been chugging along at the different points of like, whether it's immigration, whether it's um, talking about discrimination on the basis of sex, this, that, and third, but everything comes back for me to blackness and what it means to be black and hold other identities. And what that means to also be in a system where we're both like hyper visible and invisible. And so like, when I think about the question of what radicalized me, like as cliche as it sometimes might sound, it's like what radicalized me is actually me being in existence and me being in existence with community that um, we all hold these different identities, whether it's um, along the lines of class or immigration status or disability or sexuality and gender and seeing how like, and just seeing like, you know, the ways that folks are still surviving, even when every system, um, if you look at it, is meant to kind of like snuff us out. And so I, I kind of started thinking about it, I was just like, I don't think I see this as a path forward in some ways, but I think that there is room to do some destruction and I'm fine with chaos. Um, so as long as I can do what I need to do in that space, then I'm gonna do it. Um, and I think that, you know, to the point that Judith made around accountability is like, the, what keeps me in this work is actually like my accountability to my community, to the people I'm deeply in community with. Um, because sometimes I don't think that the work happens nine to five. I think that the work actually happens in a text message from a friend saying, hey, we we're hemmed up by the police in this state. We don't know what we're gonna do. It was really violent. What are the options? And hopping on a Zoom call and being like, all right, let's figure it out. Um, that's what the work looks like to me. That's what I actually think is the beauty of going to law school and coming out on the other end with this weird degree and stuff like that is a possibility of being able to meet people where they're at in the moment and figure out like, what do you want to do and how can I support you in that? Um, and these are the resources I have to offer for that. So I think that, you know, in the sense of like what radicalized means, like my community and the identities that I hold and the beautiful like people who like, you know, raised me and like made me the person I am. But on the other end, I see lawyering as a possibility for more, even when it tells you that honestly, you should always have less. Go ahead. Wow. Um, first of all, I just have amens for all the truth telling. Um, and yeah, I just really appreciate what you just said too about kind of our communities radicalizing us. Um, you know, I. I feel like radicalization is an ongoing commitment and process for me. And so, and I wanna, I just wanna define radicalization because I think that we use this term inside of movement spaces and we all know what it means. Um, but I, I think it's important to name that I think when we say radical, we mean in the Ella Baker sense. So in the kind of like long standing tradition of black organizing and that's like an uncovering, a, an unrooting of really addressing not just the symptoms of these problems that we face and have to survive but actually like demanding that we account for the roots of them which are, of course are anti-blackness and capitalism and disposability culture um, and misogyny and so really like going down to the roots and and I think addressing our attention to how we actually are changing what's underneath the surface so um and that to me has been a, a long-standing commitment that is ongoing I think you know I went to law school not radicalized I went to law school because I had been in situations um where I felt powerless before a courtroom of people who um, didn't know my life or my family's life and I felt like if I could just speak this language and this is kind of in the criminal context um, of the law that I could somehow change outcomes for folks that I loved that I would have the power to to change realities 
And law school radicalized me because what was really clear to me in law school was that speaking the language of power didn't actually give me or my people any power. Um, and in fact, that the whole system was stacked. So there was this kind of like this half truth that I believed through, I think, at least undergrad, um, that if we just had the right language, the right truth, um, that, that justice would be on our side, right? And I knew that like, there was a long history of that not being true, but hoped for something different for my people, right? The law was like, at its heart good. And I think what I learned in law school and what movement has reiterated for me is that the roots of these systems are rotten. The system isn't broken. We often talk about kind of broken systems, but I think you can't go through law school with an eye towards your own experience as a black or brown person, or, or even as like a, a working class or poor person and actually believe that this system was meant to solve um, anything except for the interest of rich white property owners, men, right? That is the history of this system. That's what it was meant for. And law school just like uncovered all of that really clearly for me um, and made it to me that, that speaking this language was not sufficient, that it wouldn't actually give anyone more power. And at its worst, it would give me more power um, and abandon the folks who I had come for. And so I was really clear that I had to be really committed um, to deep relationships with my people and to stay accountable to them. So I think that was like kind of my first moment of radicalization. Um, I left law school um, and within a year, or I guess two years, Ferguson happened, which for me was a really like incredibly instrumental moment um, as being kind of a baby lawyer. And I think even now to Christian's point, I'm still like, am I a lawyer? Is that one of my identities? Um, but at the time it was even less so, but I was still figuring out how to kind of use these tools. And I, you know, had, I was sent to Ferguson as part of my job at the time I was a fellow. Um, and I remember first of all, just being like transformed um, by the bravery, um, the audaciousness, the boldness, the clarity of folks who literally were putting their lives on the line in front of an occupying force. And were really clear that um, they weren't just just there um, because they had watched their neighbor lay in the street for hours. They were there because of all of the, the ways in which their life had been discarded um, and disposed of by the state. And so and this idea of like, how brave must we be if our people will be this brave? Like, what is the demand of us if our 15 year olds um, are standing out on the front lines of this and risking their body and life? Like, what is that demand of me as somebody who has so much more space, right? Um, and so I think, and the fact that it was like young, queer, like working class folks who, who always, quite frankly, lead our struggles with the boredness. But I think for me, as somebody who was, you know, like, I thought I was still young. <laughs> I'm like in my early 30s, I'm here for it. And literally those like 15 and 14 year olds who are like leading the way with this vision that's so clear. Um, and that, that to me was just a real like, like a calling of like, okay, so what is this? What are you giving up? Like, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to risk for this? And and um, I think the other moment for me was kind of in the post Ferguson moment um, that I was trying my best to help. And to Christians, when I was like, I'll get your water for you, like whatever you need, <laughs> like I, I can help with it. And like, I will find whatever lane you think I'm helpful in, I'm down to help with. And I was at that point doing a lot of policy stuff around policing. And I thought again, that I was like at the vanguard, I was feeling more and more radicalized. I was an abolitionist. I thought I was totally down. Um, and I think that I really had a sense that I could be of assistance around, around policy stuff. And so I went to, it was actually, um, it was right after the killing of Jamal Clark um, in Minneapolis. And it was with the same folks who of course have led all the work in Minneapolis now as well. And I was going down there to like help them develop demands essentially. That I was like the lawyer who could like find a policy, write a policy, whatever you need. And I had, I think at that point kind of a checklist of like, what are the things that you can do in response to a police killing? And this, this group of folks who are amazing black organizers um, had occupied a precinct for I think it was like a week or something following the killing of Jamal Clark and a police precinct in wintertime in Minneapolis. So like not a joke, nobody was joking. It was so serious and so cold. And they were making demands around police reform. And so I thought that I kind of had a list that they could borrow from. So I was like oversight boards, you know, like what other kind of list of possibilities? And so I get to this meeting, I feel like I'm prepped for the meeting. And one of the organizers looks at me after I kind of present, like here are some options. And she's like, we're actually interested in abolishing the police. Like what, what would you recommend for next steps for that? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, that's not on my list. I, like, and this is before really this becomes the demand, right? This is a, a moment of body cameras and prosecutions was 2016. And I think for me, it was this like realization that my imagination was not sufficient that I had to be in space and be willing to listen, be willing to be like, I do not know the answer to this. 
that. Like, I don't, and I think as lawyers were taught to say no, like, oh, that's not possible, sorry, next. Um, or to set the confines of the conversation or the possibility. And what I realized in that moment was that my imagination was not sufficient. That the people who were on the front lines who were like risking everything had bolder visions of what was possible than I did. And that I needed to like lean into how my tools could support building that vision. And so for me, that was transformational. Like I never again started a conversation with like here are the demands. I never again like leaned into thinking that I had the expertise to decide what was possible in a place. And I think really started asking how instead of no. And so to every kind of request that we get, I, I try and say like, okay, like how can we do that? <laughs> um, and I think it's a really important question for us to lean into. But those were the moments for me that have radicalized me. And I think this, I mean, I remain constantly radicalized by like the boldness and vision um, of folks who, who come after, who are just constantly demanding more of us. Thank you. For, thank you everyone <laughs> for sharing not only like what, where you've been, what the journey has been like, the moments for you that were really like watershed moments for you. But the, the title of this webinar is Black History is Now. So what we wanna know is like, what is the work now? What are you, what is the work that you see as most urgent from your position or with the people that you are in community with right now? And I'll let anybody start. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, <clears throat> I think I think this gets to what Mar was talking about, which is the um, imagination of our people, right? Like when the people on the front lines, and I learned this early in Mississippi, right? That people were ready to take big risks for their freedom. And that I wasn't going to stand in the way of that, <laughs> but I had to figure out how to support them in taking those risks. And those risks could have been, you know, what may seem small nowadays, but when you're in the Mississippi Delta and there's a plantation owner who controls everything from everybody's jobs to um, the school system, uh, to every, the churches, et cetera, going up against the white plantation owner is a big deal. Um, and now when I, you know, all these years later, I think about the work is supporting our people in dreaming about freedom, um, supporting our people in thinking, and this is why I say the law, like I always think the law is wrong, right? Like stop thinking about what is precedent. I don't care about precedent. Precedent is what got us here in this mess right now. And so I think the, the work right now is to support those freedom dreams. The work is to um, give people the tools that they need in their dreaming, right? And, and being able to help them um, move and articulate that, whether it's the Breathe Act, right, with M, M for BL, right? And that is that omnibus bill that will be, right, has everything in there that our communities need to be free. And so um, I, I'm excited about where we are right now um, because I feel like our movements are stronger than they've been in my several years of doing this kind of work. Um, that there's more coordination, that um, people are ready to take big risks. And so there is the work around police, because I don't think if we don't get the police off our necks, literally and figuratively, and take down that structure, we will continue to be controlled. And so I think that is one piece of the work in terms of issues that we need to be focused on. Um, but it is also about continuing to build power. Like I'm wearing Police Free Schools t-shirt. Young people did this <laughs> and young people are winning, right? Like when I say young people, I'm not talking about young people like you, Ameka. I'm talking about teenagers, right? <laughs> I'm talking about like, and again, it is them dreaming about what could be and saying what is, is not working for them. 
and not supporting them and nurturing them and that they can't thrive with it. And so um, our, our job is to keep being radical, keep pushing the envelope, keep supporting people and building power. I can jump in. Um, I have like two lofty things that are, are like, what's the work now? And then I have something concrete. So the two lofty things for me that are what the, what the work is now is that I think is true, should be true for everybody is to one, stop lying and to two, tell the truth. So <laughs> those are two different things. They're related, but <laughs> To me, it's important to like distinguish those two, right? To stop lying and to tell the truth. So by stop lying, I mean like lawyers are trained liars. Like we are trained to lie. And I, one example I can give of this is sitting in law school in, I think it was my first year. I was ready to quit over this. I was like, nah, I can't do this. I got to get out of here. You all will spin me around and tell me that the sky is green or something. I was in a constitutional law class and, um, you know, it was it, constitutional law based in history, yada, 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 but the history is wrong. Like it's, it's wrong. The way y'all are telling this history is a lie. The way you were talking about what has happened to folks is a lie. So now you're talking to me about these cases and all this precedent and why they made decisions, but the facts are wrong. And now we're recreating these lies for all of these people who are going to go out and be, I was at a social justice law school, civil rights attorneys, constitutional law scholars, and you have the history wrong, you have the facts wrong. And so we're perpetuating these lies about people on the ground, about our folks, about what's going on, but then we carry that into our work. There are, in my experience, um, practicing civil rights law and criminal defense, and again, limited experience, brands baking into this game, but lawyers are lying to themselves too in this arena, lying to themselves saying that we want to dismantle this, unpackage that, and not telling the truth about their own investment in these systems. You have a financial incentive to let police beat on folks because your money gets made based off of taking these cases for people. You have financial incentive. And so you actually don't have any reason to have a broader understanding of why police need to be abolished, why all of this needs to be dismantled. You are invested in not quite getting why folks who you're representing want to make certain arguments and want to leave others on the table. And you're lying to them about the possibilities of what they can do with their case because you think you have the best understanding of what they should be trying to accomplish, which for you is on the money side. So you're lying to yourself about why you're doing this work. You're lying to your client about the possibilities of this work. And you're not telling the truth about what we can truly do. And that extends to lawyers who work with organizers. So often lawyers who are working with organizers are going into the room with a plan and not truly telling organizers and activists and all the folks on the ground what is possible. Maybe because they don't know, but I think it's because they're lying to themselves and they don't wanna divest from the power that they think they have both in that room, but also when they're walking into a courtroom, into a policy room, or into any of these spaces where they've given up some of their freedom for power. And for me, that's a key part of Stop Lying whether it's to yourself or to organizers or to anybody else you're coming into contact with, you have to stop lying and you have to start telling the truth. You can say, okay, this is as far as I go. I don't wanna take those risks. I don't wanna lose my seat at this table, even though I know it shouldn't exist. I don't wanna be kicked out of this room, even though I know we should burn down this house. And because I don't wanna do that, here is as far as I'm willing to take the point that you're trying to push as an organizer, as an activist, as a community member, as a person that I say that I'm here for and representing. And so for me, the, the, the really important part, the really important work we should all be doing right now, particularly as lawyers, is to stop lying, both about what the history is, what our capabilities are, and what our, what our investment is into the current power structure, and to start telling the truth. 
And so for me, that extends to the work of breaking down these silos. So this is the concrete part. Maybe it won't seem concrete to you, but as somebody who has come from, you know, being a part of the work on the ground, stepping into these courtrooms, I feel so uncomfortable. Going to these policy tables where folks are not actually talking to the folks on the ground. The work for me right now is to stop whittling away at what organizers, activists, and folks experiencing harm say they want. Because you think you know what's possible in this moment that they created for you as a policy person, as a lawyer, as somebody who has found a way to play the game and invest and get a little bit of piece of this power that you won't divest from now. It is so frustrating to watch all of these folks in these rooms whittle away at the demands of people on the ground who are putting their lives, their bodies, their futures on the ground so that we can get free. It is so frustrating to watch these bills pass or even go up for a conversation or to watch people enter rooms with power based off of the work that people have done on the ground. And this summer was so exhausting. This past summer, it was so exhausting to be a part of that work on the ground and to watch all these quote unquote wins that are coming out be different than what people were asking for, be less than what people were asking for, be diluted from what people were asking for because those folks at those tables and those rooms think they know better than the folks who were calling on the ground. Every time I see a, a flyer that says beyond the protest, I get so frustrated because you won't have that moment <laughs> without that protest. You won't have that little power, that little pressure that you think you have without the protest. And instead of getting in line with folks on the ground, you've decided to make decisions on their behalf. And so that for me is what the work is. Stop lying, tell the truth, and get in alignment with the people putting their lives at risk. Um. I'll go really quickly next because I think it might build off of what you were just talking about. So I was thinking about it. I actually wish for, I would love an audit, like an internal audit of where we actually are. Um, I think that the thing that becomes quite frustrating to me is that because we sometimes have a tendency to exist in silos, we're possibly not moving from the margins in our work. And so what happens is that progress is made, but for a select few. And what I'm noticing now is that there are a lot of people out there who are saying like, okay, but well what about us? Um, and who are putting in that work um, to advance community, to do what needs to be done, putting their bodies on the line, showing up, doing whatever can be done because they know at the end of the day, because of the way that blackness functions in the US, um, is either with all of us or none of us, honestly, at the end of the day. And so my biggest thing right now is um, put the work in to do an audit. And let's be, to a certain extent, honest about who's actually getting any sort of, who's getting freer, <laughs> um, you know? And that freer might look jacked up because most of the times it will be jacked up in the US. But let's be real about who's getting freer because I think I sometimes look and get frustrated and sad because those same issues that happened along the path with the civil rights movement, with you know the Black Panthers, with every single other like you know movement that has come before this moment, I'm seeing happen right now, and I'm seeing people get left behind right now in real time. And so I really want us to be honest about what we look, what we think freedom looks like, versus what freedom needs to be or what liberation needs to be. And maybe our freedom all look the same, but we definitely definitely can't leave people behind. And I think that it becomes sometimes a little bit dangerous, especially for people in the legal sphere who we know the confines and the limitations that come with the law. And so we know that there is like this sometimes urge of, you know, most of the folks who do this piecemeal project of like, well, like we'll move the ball forward here, but don't worry, we're coming back for you. And I'm like, you're not though, like you're not. Um, you escaped the plantation, you're not coming back. It's cool, I understand. But just know that you left people behind um, and recognize that. And I think that that's actually the work that has to be done is like, let's be real, let's do an audit. Let's actually talk about who we are leaving behind and let's name that 
because if we keep on moving in a way where we're saying that we're gaining all this progress, but I'm seeing more and more people get left behind because of things like class, disability, sexuality, gender, like you name it, then we're not doing the work, honestly. And I think that's going to upset a lot of people because, you know, everyone wants to feel like we're making progress, but like, are we making progress if that means that we actually have to leave people behind? I don't think that's progress. So I like this theme of Black history is now, and, you know, Queen Mother Moore, I sat at her feet. I learned about first about reparations from Queen Mother Moore, who kept that issue alive all of her life. I sat at the feet of Imari Abubakari Obadeli, who basically was the architect behind uh, what we call the New African Independence Movement. I learned so very much from the wisdom of Brother Chokwe Lumumba long before he even thought about becoming any type of mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. But these are the folk that, uh, you know, I learned from Sister Safia Bukhari, member of the Black Liberation Army, who stood up in a courtroom in Goochland, Virginia, and said, you cannot try me in your court of law because I'm a citizen of the Republic of New Africa. Those were the things that was moving and grooving me when Chokwe Lumumba was representing Mutulu Shakur in a court in um, uh, New York, he asked me to do a, 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 a brief, and I'm doing this brief, this international law brief on using the Geneva Convention in a U.S. Uh, court dealing with how the treatment of prisoners of war should be and applying it, and this is the first time a judge required the government, okay, the Department of Justice, the Department of the Army, the this, that, no, to actually respond to our briefs, our Geneva Convention brief. Now, of course, they was dismissed and all like that. But the fact that a response was required was just really very uh, pivotal. I sat at the feet of Hayward Burns. I'm talking about luminaries with the National Conference of Black Lawyers. I remember the last time that I saw him alive, he was in, we were in, in, up in, in, in Congress and we were doing a briefing or opening it up the church committee hearings, those were the US Senate Intelligence Committee hearings that investigated the COINTELPRO, the FBI's one secret, quite illegal uh, a war <laughs> against the uh, Black uh, community. Uh, uh, Bob Mar Margaret Burnham, who um, uh, was actually a lawyer for Angela Davis, you know, back in the day. A lot of times we don't know these, 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 these people. Stan Willis of Chicago bumped into him on the street of Washington, D.C. I said, Sam, what you doing here in D.C.? He said, I'm going before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and filed this, 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 to, to try to get this hearing on this police torture, verge tortures in Chicago. And I'm looking, damn, I grew up in D.C. I ain't never even heard of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, but it put a seed in my mind. Maybe we can also use that vehicle to illuminate the issue of the disparity between crack and powder cocaine. This is before it became a fashion. This is before people were talking about it. This is when we were just, just trying to get some type of, of movement on uh, the issue. The issue of genocide, when we talk about Black history then and now, know why, Judy, we need to talk because I'm not quite sure why we're not using Marbury, these international law conventions in US law. I'm sitting in law school and the Geneva Convention is being passed, which isn't just killing off the native peoples or burning the Jews and others. It's killing members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting upon the group conditions of life calculated to bring about the destruction in whole or in part, taking measures to prevent births within the group, transferring children from one group to another. Those are the provisions of the Genocide Convention. And genocide is not the only actual act. Conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, um, attempt to commit genocide and complicity. And it goes on to say that those guilty of genocide shall be punished regardless of whether they are constitutionally protected rulers, public officials, and private citizens. And I'm thinking, damn, listen, y'all, these were before all those other human rights conventions which restricted its use in US law. This convention came with implementing legislation. It's in the US code. Why don't we not use this? I was bringing
bringing this up. I, I wrote a law review um, article on an American Constitution a Society and um, uh, 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 some folk approached me about this international tribunal that's going to be in, um, I don't know, happening, dealing with political prisoners and prisoners of war. And they wanted to use this, my argument as the basis. And I said, great, because nobody else seems to take it uh, seriously. But then I'm on a call with a white lawyer, a traditional, um, what do you call it, law firm type lawyer. And he's up there telling me, oh, no, you can't use this because, you know, um, um, you know, USS, the, you know, all, like all the other treaties that, you know, and I said, no, this implementing legislation, he immediately dismissed me because who am I? A deeply melanated woman with frizzy hair uh, and an African name who obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. He had to come back and apologize because he was wrong and I was right. So I just want to say Black history, the things that we were talking about in the past are coming to like today. Reparations. Who would have thought, who would have thought that it would have been on the mouths of the candidates vying for the 2020 Democratic uh, election? Who would have thought of the hearing that was just last week in Congress? Who would have thought about the historic hearing that was last year? I mean, I'm just saying reparations is an issue whose time has come. So all of those things that I was talking about way back in the day, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to get a law degree so people would start paying attention are beginning to come um, uh, to food. There's a whole lot more, but I'm just going to leave it at that. I got a whole lot of that in my book, Black Power, Black Lawyer, My Audacious Quest for Justice. Yes. I'm going to go because I oh, feel like I'm going to go. Oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you want to go? You want to go? I, gonna, I was going to really quickly amen the reparations piece. Oh. At the end of it. And I, I guess. So in terms of demand, I think reparations is definitely an idea whose time has come. And I think not just as a demand around what's dissolved, but I think the framework of reparations is really important, which is that we have to assess the ways that these systems, the ways that these laws, the ways that this culture has destroyed, killed, um, oppressed, and um, really destroyed our communities. And that we have to repair those harms. And that looks like all sorts of things. But I think that, you know, the movement around our liberation, whether it's the abolitionist movement that is still unfinished, whether it's the civil rights movement, um, has always been radical. And I think that the sanitization of our movement, we have to really address. The demands have always been the same, that we have, a, this system has never solved us, and it has to be uprooted and remade. Um, and so I think that those demands really still stand. In terms of what I think lawyers and legal workers should do, I just want to put off what Christian said, which is I think there's a delegitimization that we have to be engaged in, that so much of um, these systems systems are illegitimate. They're not just wrong or bad. They're like literally illegitimate. They're based on genocide of indigenous people. They're based on the, the enslavement, um, the rape of black folks across this, this country and this globe. And so I think we have to like name that. And as system actors, which many of us all, we are inside these systems using these tools. I think it's our job both to use them to mitigate harm, but also to really do the work of delegitimizing them. And these are not systems that should stand. And even as we're using them as shields, we have to I think be doing the work to make it clear that we're not the the only um the only kind of speakers we should th that this room should be brought down how do we engage in those conversations in ways that i think protects our people while also being really clear that, that the kind of privilege we're given inside these systems is illegitimate as well and so i think really balancing and holding that is important and then i would agree with christian too like the watering down of demands is is like is in ridiculous at this point, the ability of folks who have power to say, like, oh, they don't mean defund, they mean, and like, no, 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 no. <laughs> they said defund, they wrote defund, they mean defund, we mean defund, like we real clear on that. But I think there's a real attempt to, again, like as history is being made to sanitize the demands of people who are on the front lines making those demands. And I think it's our job as folks who have some power and some privilege because of our positions to echo and uplift and shift power um, away from ourselves in many ways and to the folks who are leading and making this moment possible. So I, I just echo everything, uh, and, and Kichi, you, you are on fire as usual, burning up, girl. Thank you, thank you. You mentioned so many people. I was, I was having church over here when you mentioned Haywood. That was my dean and my, one of my best friends, uh, and losing him was certainly a tragedy, especially at the time when he was at his height of understanding those international connections and understanding our role as members of the diaspora, as Africans. And so for me, I think Black history has to mean a severing of ties with those who hurt us, who look like us. 
It's got to mean that. We got to wage real class struggle. And I learned that a long time ago when I was done in by some Negroes when we were trying to organize in Newark, but I've learned it more recently in this election cycle. People literally lost their minds over Trump and then didn't and, and acted like the lesser of two evils were gonna be so much more revolutionary and so much more profound and necessary for us. We gotta tell the truth, like my sister said, we gotta stop lying and tell the truth. We gotta remember Kamala Harris's history. I'm sorry, folks. I was just looking at another version, not a version, but another account of something that happened in California with a sister named Mytrice Richardson, who was abducted and murdered, I think it was in 80, 84 or 94, I'm not sure, but Kamala was the attorney general at the time, and there was a whole article on this type of betrayal that she was a part of. And I'm not singling her out for any other reason other than to say we need to come out of this AIDS that we're in and stop lifting up people and making them into folk heroes when we know they got baggage. They got more baggage than a long trip abroad, okay? They got more baggage than we even know about. And that's what makes me think that Black history also means a party for Black people. Black history means alternatives to this structure all together, that Black folks are no longer hook-lined and sinkered, blinded by the light and, and just moving blindly toward the Democrats. We damn sure ain't moving toward the Republicans, but the Democrats have to take account for some of the things that they've done to our people. And this is Jeribu. I want to put that disclaimer on. I, I want to make sure y'all understand this is just me talking. I like to own everything that I say so that people don't have to get the fallout from it. I'm falling out, so it's no, no hope for me. But I just think Black history means Black self-determination. It means toppling capitalism. It means we're no longer capital. It means we're no longer property. We're no longer counted with sheep and oxen, okay? It means real freedom for our people. And I remember, and I'll tell you this one last short story about class struggle, where I was litigating against Walmart in Natchez, Mississippi. We were in depositions. And at some point, the white female lawyer was deposing my client. And she asked her the demographic questions, you know, the icebreaker type questions. Uh, what's your full name? Where were you born? And she got to the point where she started asking about her family. And she said, do you have children? She says, yes. And she said, what are their names? And so she gave each one of the names of her children. And then the white female lawyer said, and what are their father's names? With an S on it, right? Now our families come in all forms. That's not the point. The point is she made an assumption based on her racist notion about our families and about who this young woman was and she didn't even know her. And it just so happened when she named her children, she, when she gave the name, the father was the same for all the children. But so what if it wasn't? I objected. I didn't even let my client answer the question. I objected to the question. So at some point we were able to go out into the lobby and you know, on a bathroom break and I see this woman. I decide I'm gonna tell her why I objected, right? That I'm gonna take her to school. I asked my black woman co-counsel who I handpicked to be co-counsel with me. That's why I say values are important. Just cause somebody look like you, don't grab them to be co-counsel if they don't believe what you believe, especially when it comes to black freedom. So I say to her, I said, look, I'm gonna check this woman. I wanna go talk to her and let her know why I objected to her line of questioning. I said, do you wanna come with me? No, nah, no, nah, that's your thing, you go. Now this is someone I handpicked and we supposed to be friends, we supposed to be sisters. She let me know right then and there. Now that's some of your stuff, you go do it. She was not willing to come with me to defend our client's right not to be insulted, not to be in any way put down whether her family structure was what we know it to be or what we like it to be. She had no right to question her along those lines. So I went by myself, what the hell, like we always have to do. I went to her and she's talking on the cell phone. And I say, you know, like that. So she is so terrified. She sees the, the I don't know, she sees the black monster, the black baboon, and she just goes crazy, right? She drops her, her phone in her, in her tote bag and is still talking. The person is saying, hello, 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 are you there? And I said, I think your purse is talking. And so she 
cuts off her phone real quick. I said, well, I just wanted to let you know that we're very sensitive about our families because of the way we've been treated in this country because of racism. I said, and that question was offensive and it offended me if it didn't offend my client. And I wanted to let you know it was objectionable. That's why I objected. Oh, I didn't mean anything by it. I didn't mean anything by it. it, it, it okay, okay. You know, so she's nervously scurrying on, but I was so glad that I took her on and that's what we got to do. That's what black history is. Black history is taking them on, standing there, making sure that our people are not further harmed. And if we walk away with a tightness in our stomach because we let some shit go down, that's the problem. That's the problem. We've got to be. And I know, I know I've, I've lost friends in the election cycle. Lost a couple of friends that I thought, thought were radicals. Got up from a table when I told them that I just couldn't, when Hillary was running, I said, I just couldn't vote for her. Oh, she jumped up from the table. Oh, well then you voted for Trump and she hasn't spoken to me since. We gotta be clear on who the real enemies are. We gotta stop sacrificing relationships and friendships when they are sitting in a back room plotting and planning our demise while we are turning on each other instead of speaking real truth. And, and the sister Christian is right, stop lying and tell the truth. So I, I'm getting this off my chest everywhere, not just here, I'm getting this off my size 34 Bs everywhere I go. I'm saying it, I'm saying it out loud. I've been saying it all through the election cycle. I was saying, yes, we gotta get rid of the orange man. No question, we gotta get rid of him. We should do a dump Trump movement like we did a dump Koch movement in New York. We should do that for sure. But at the same time, we don't need to glorify the records of these other folks, right? right, right. We don't need to do that. And that's what we've been doing. And where is the left? That's a, your next website webinar. Where is the left? Where is, our, where is our opposition to this? When we lockstep climb into bed with it, how do we distinguish ourselves from it? Is, is just my frustrating question, so. Thank you for that, Jeribu. That, you're leaving us with a lot um, to think about. And I know we're slightly over time, but I just wanna take um, two of the questions in the chat box and um, feel free to jump in and answer them. We have two. Um, so one is how do we create space for dreaming? What does that look like? And then the second is from an undergrad, a black queer student in Chicago wants to know how as undergrads, can we get more involved in the work? Um, how have you all been able to find opportunities in this field? Um, yeah, so those are the two questions and feel free to jump in. Well, let me just say, I, I would say just very quickly how not to find space to dream. <laughs> okay, and then I'll let the folk who are doing it right say how you can find space to dream. How not to find space to dream is how I've been doing it all my life, working from sunup to sundown to not, I mean, and in this Zoom thing, it's like, it's like total complete 24 uh, seven. Um, what I'm learning from the, the next generation is that you got to find time for self-care. And I hear this and I feel so jealous when I see folk coming back from Jamaica and doing the, the spa and all like that. So I want to sit back and listen to this answer as to how we can find this space when we're, some of us are so used to just that's why they called it the struggle because we were just always struggling. We, and, and you know, and how can we do this so that we can live and survive and be able to do this work without the stress? So I'm gonna shut up and I want to hear the answer to that question so that I can start doing right what I've been doing wrong for the past over 40 years. Um, can I jump in real quick? So to the point that you're saying, um, finding space to dream has honestly looked like stepping out of legal spaces, to be honest, um, because it's also a reset. Um, I like thinking about it as like, the way that I came to the law is actually through literature. Like I grew up with like, my mom was a avid reader in like women's like, you know, black women's book clubs. So I would see all the books she would have on her shelves. And that's how I like first came to Toni Morrison and The Bluest Eye and like all these great pieces of literature. And I found that like, my ability to dream is actually directly can um, directly 
connected to my ability to access authors um, and to see the worlds that they are building. Um, because I think that that becomes a moment where I'm just like, there's something more possible. And it might not be tomorrow and it might not be like in 10 years, but there is something more possible. And I love to return to black writers specifically for that reason, um, especially black writers who are like black, you know, queer, trans, like, because then you just start to see a world look bigger and bigger and bigger um, and it, it holds people. Um, so that's the one thing. And then for uh, the student who's an undergrad, the one thing I'll say is that I'll be honest about my path. It's been hard. <laughs> like, I think, you know, being black in this space, is just, it's rough. And I think that not everybody wants to name that sometimes. Um, they just want you to get your foot in the door and like, oh, the doors will, you know, you'll work and you'll open up and then let's be real. Like the way that the same way racism and anti-black violence and all that plays into like every other space plays into the legal space as well. Um, and it plays into opportunities. Um, and so, you know, as much as you can hustle and be aggressive and like, you know, all this other stuff and, you know, work at that story about, you know, you gotta be three steps ahead. Honestly, it don't matter if you're 10 steps ahead. Um, like I will say just like, you know, find the communities that you're in and deeply plug in because that's the way that I was able to find opportunity was that I actually just deeply invested in the communities that I, I saw myself being accountable to who were also accountable to me. Um, and it was mostly connected to whatever I was really passionate about. So I started doing digital like organizing and campaigning and got deeply into like reproductive healthcare. I started doing work around that stuff and got deeply into that. So just like, I don't know, my thing is like go deep in those communities because honestly, those are also life-saving things to do. I just wanted to add to the dreaming piece that for me, um, it has also been to your point, stepping outside of the, of the legal <laughs> sphere, right? Um, I have found the best dreaming spaces have been around youth organizers. And that might be in part because they're not tainted by what, what is, right? They still have this idea that there is something else out there beyond what is for them. Um, and so that has been a beautiful space to be thinking about what your school could look like, what your neighborhood could look like, right? And 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 it's expansive for them. Um, and so I think being in those spaces for lawyers is important, but being in those spaces as lawyers and not being, you know, not sucking the air out the room, right? But being part of the process and listening to young people and listening to impacted people just generally, like our communities know that what they are experiencing is wrong and that there is something else. And so if you just take a moment to listen to people, they know about something better. They know about what they want, right? And we just, I think sometimes don't do enough of that. I think about another experience is when the Dream Defenders took over the state capitol in Florida and 29 plus days of being in the capitol after Trayvon Martin was killed and using that space as a space to dream, right? And to think about how can we, first of all, take over Florida how can we change Florida? And if there's policies we want pushed, what does that look like? But what is the organizing mechanism that we want also? And so I think in those spaces of adversity is where our people also come to face to face with like, this is not what will be for us. I'm gonna jump in real quick. Um, the piece about dreaming. So. For me personally, I joined um, an organization back when I joined it, it was just a collective called the Sada's Daughters. When I was in law school, I joined this organization. And what um, it really got me through law school. And the reason that it got me through law school is because I was surrounded by black women, queer folks, um, gender non-binary folks who were a part of this organization who were helping me um, understand that my feeling in law school of all of this is fucked up was not wrong. That were helping me process through and understand that no, all of this indoctrination that law school is doing, I can divest from this because I don't, I don't need it. And yeah, to a certain extent, in order to be um, an attorney or in the law or whatever with this degree, um, I needed to 
understand it enough to get through law school and to pass the bar, but I didn't need to internalize it because there was work to be done, so much work to be done outside of the law. Um, and they helped me hold on to my dreams and reject the internalization that law school was trying to promote. I found law school to be an absolutely horrid, horrendous, terrible, uh, cry every day type of experience. And I haven't found the law to be any different, to be quite honest, um, in terms of practicing in the law, especially in doing civil rights and criminal defense work. It has been, these spaces in litigation are absolutely terrible. Um, you know, it, it is uh, really frustrating um, to go through every day in, in name of defense of our people. And and I had Margaret Burnham as a professor and a, a, was a research assistant for her. And I still found it to be an absolutely horrible experience. And part of that I put on us and us as attorneys and us as black people who have gotten through all of that horrible experience is that we tend to leave folks who look like us, who are experiencing these things, who are going in with the politics alone. We tend to leave us isolated. I had not heard of and again, first generation college student, let alone law student, I had not heard of any of these black attorneys, any of these radical folks when I went to law school, as I was going through law school, I stumbled on Evelyn Williams book, Inadmissible Evidence, stumbled on that book and had, ne had never heard of any, never heard of the National Conference of Black Lawyers, Balsa was what was being pushed and no one had explained the connection. I had not heard these stories. I knew about the Republic of New Africa from my understanding of, uh, and um, you know, long history of political education, but I didn't know anything about the lawyers who were, you know, helping folks. I knew about a lot of these arguments, but again, had never heard of how we had applied these things to folks, even if they had failed. And that's our fault. And I say R because now I'm an attorney and need to also be telling these stories, but I'm talking about the collective R. Where are these stories? Where are, is this political education of folks who are interested in using the law as this defensive mechanism um, and trying to not be indoctrinated into this white supremacist system that they want us to be? Where are they? And to me, it's important to have that in order to be able to dream. I shouldn't have to recreate what y'all have done. I should be able to build off of that foundation. And in Asada's, the space that I still hold on to as a place for dreaming, that's what we do. We provide political education to young people in Asada's names, in her um, understanding that nobody, especially white supremacists, are going to give us our education. And as Black attorneys, we need to hold on to that and uplift that. The law schools are not going to give us the education that we need to be the radical lawyers for our folks that we can be. We need ourselves and each other to provide that education. And that education will enable us to dream because in order to dream, we have to be able to imagine and to see and to know that not only is it possible, folks have attempted it and we can learn lessons both from their successes and from their missteps. Well, there is a, a song that, uh, not gonna sing it, uh, by Regina Bell, she talks about dream and color. She says, when I dream, I dream in color. I want a love, not just a lover. And she goes on to say, show me a child who never had a dream. I'll give you so many reasons to capture a dream. I think dreaming for me is dreaming about total liberation, uh, dreaming about uh, capitalism, finally having that last snap of the neck and dying, but I know that's not going to happen in my lifetime, but I dream about people progressively moving forward toward a new day and not just accepting what is. And uh, I know folks are always on me about taking time off and getting rest and taking care of myself. And believe it or not, this is the way I take care of myself. These conversations, these interactions with other revolutionary Black women, who don't make me feel like I'm not insane by thinking these thoughts, because sometimes you can go into rooms and people can look like you, but they are not of you and they push you down and crush your dreams. And so when you are in a room like this, it's hard to let it go 
I mean, we're already almost at eight o'clock. And the reason for that is because it's hard to let go of something that is so holistically positive. I want a t-shirt that says, stop lying and tell the truth, Christian. I want a t-shirt. I want to make me a t-shirt that says that because it's so true. And in the circles that we're in, in the zones of privilege where we are, if we can retreat to something like this every now and then, it, it would just be so amazing. I was on a uh, uh, watch a movie watch with Nkichi where we watched the film Regina King's movie One Night in Miami. And I was so excited to be able to do that because how often do we as revolutionaries get to socialize together, watch a film and have conversation? Yeah, there was some craziness in the chat, you know, and crazy Imhotep types who were saying stuff like, you know, you basically want you barefoot and pregnant, but we were able to go through it. And Kichi, I thought you did an excellent job showing grace and, and constraint I saw a couple of times you were like, oh, wait, wait, what are you talking about? But it was good even to hear some of the stuff that we might not agree with. It was still good to be, you know, in that in that way, being present. So I, I just think more of that, more, more times to have fun, more times to kick it with people who, when you say something that calls for revolution, they don't look at you like, how did you get invited to this party? That that is the party. Right, everybody there is talking revolution, whether it's about Fred Hampton or whether it's about Asada, whatever the issue, they're not looking at you like you're crazy. I, I just long for that, a free sort of environment where you can share these ideas and talk about things that concern you. And you can talk about stopping the murders of black trans women without people saying, yeah, but why, did they, why are they like that? You know, or I mean, just so backwards and beyond homophobic. Right, some of the comments in the in the Bible Belt is horrible here. The environment, but being able to step outside of that and come into this is is a dream for me, and I want it to come true. I really do. On that note, we are we need to bring this beautiful space to a close. Um, thank you to all of you for bringing so much of yourselves and so much honesty and so much history and brilliance um, and sharing with us and with one another in this conversation. Um, so uh, Marbre, are you gonna take us out or are we good? <laughs> good? I'm gonna hold this, stop lying, tell the truth. I feel like that's the take out, but thank y'all so much. And thank you, Amika, for all the and holding us. All right. Thank Bye you, everyone. everybody. Bye. See you soon, see you soon.